Talking about first-person shooter games, it's like a fantasy dream. Welcome to Infinity Cam. Today we gonna talk about 10 first-person shooter game for smartphones. But before we start, we upload videos every week. Be sure to subscribe and turn on notification for more amazing videos. 10. Pixar Gun 3D. Generally, 8-bit games are confined to puzzles and endless runners while first-person shooters boast stunning and realistic graphics. Pixelated FPS games are a rare breed, limited to a few popular titles like Doom 2 or Wolfenstein. Pixel Gun 3D is the new sibling which has been clinging to the top 8 games for some time. Let's see why. To start with, it is the zombie story all over again, but in a better way. You're left in the open, vulnerable to the undead and with just a revolver at hand. Roam around the map and dozens of them charge towards you. The mission eliminate all monsters without getting yourself zombified. Let me warn you, this game is a lot harder than an average RPG. The arenas are cross-connected and strategically designed with multiple areas of interest, reminding us of the classic Counter-Strike. Move tactically, collect power-ups and shoot to kill. The game is extremely flexible with dozens of maps like shooting range, prison, hospital, pool, soccer ground and street, a huge collection of weapons including axe, knife, guns like pistol, shotgun, Uzi and Ak, plenty of power-ups like ammo, weapons, life and hidden gems with a variety of villains like zombies, ghosts, dogs, cut heads, spiders, slender man, dolls and birds. Quite a handful. Pixel Gun 3D provides two modes. In survival mode, take out everyone and proceed in maps till you become one of them. The multiplayer mode lets you rub your FPS skill with others, locally or overseas. Here, you have unlimited lies but the one who reaches 10 kills first is declared the winner. The graphics, of course, is 8-bit type but not as crude as some other games like Super Brothers Sword and Sorcery. Sound effects are great and so are the controls. In-app purchases can help you restore your health, fill your clip, get more weapons or even resurrect you with a cup of elixir. Execution-wise, absence of headshots is a real disappointment as far as I am concerned. Though many zombies are headless and others double-headed, a single bullet to blow up brains always gives you a rush. I really miss that in Pixel Gun 3D. Also, a map or even a radar system like in Dead Trigger would be appreciated. A unique thing about the game is that it comes with a free skin maker for PC edition of Minecraft. I'm not sure why, but if it is intended to clock more purchases, it is certainly working well. After all these clutter, let me come to the final word. Pixel Gun 3D is a harder and more addictive FPS game than the lot. But absence of headshots and eye-popping visuals will surely be missed. So if you're okay with the block world, this is one game that should not be missed. Nine, Suicide Squad Special Ops. Suicide Squad Special Ops is an endless survival high-score chaser where you play as three characters from the movie Deadshot, El Diablo and Harley Quinn. You are fighting against waves of undead humanoid monsters who are shooting assault rifles and hacking with axes. You can choose the order you play the characters, but as each dies, a surviving member of the squad immediately takes over. The characters have unique weapons and skills, ideal for different types of attacks, and the game features robust and responsive melee and ranged combat. Deadshot wields an assault rifle and wrist-mounted guns, and can activate an aggressive marksman mode after making direct hits. El Diablo shoots fire streams from his hands and can unleash supernova mode after successive attacks. Harley Quinn carries a baseball bat and a magnum revolver and goes into brutal frenzy mode when she gets multiple kills. Each character's power mode grants additional bonus points, making successive kills even more fruitful. This positive feedback cycle of more kills creating more power modes organically increases the excitement in the game, while raising the stakes as the onslaught persists. A notable design feature of Suicide Squad is that the experience of playing each individual character is unique, and you'll always get to play all three so you'll improve with each over time. It feels very different to shoot streams of fire than to bash with a baseball bat. Your character isn't attacking on rails, but rather has a full 360 degrees of smooth, responsive movement. Fighting is simple and intuitive because once an enemy is within your crosshairs you'll automatically attack. You'll need to reload using the ample ammo crates throughout the scenes and as baddies expire, you can grab health boosts to recoup your stats. Supply crates appear periodically and offer fun extra features and consumables. Though two of the characters have two weapons to equip, there are no confusing upgrade systems for the weapons. Gameplay strategy is extremely accessible, particularly for first-time FPS players or those who normally shy away from combat because it is an endless survival game, you will have cheap deaths at the beginning while you're learning each squad member's skill. But with each successive replay, you'll improve and get further into the gritty world of the game. The waves of enemies do get really intense the further you advance, but you'll also be more skilled and more powerful as you progress. For all the perfect points the game scores, there are a few missed targets. There is no way to save game progress and no checkpoints, so you'll be starting over each time you play. 
As such, you'll need to be ready to sink some serious time into playing if you want to advance meaningfully. Wait. Unkilled multiplayer zombie survival. Unkilled highlights this, and helps underscore the civic responsibility of ridding the world of zombies. Yes, it's another zombie apocalypse trip, but this one puts the player in the professor's seat as part of an elite team that takes the undead out. Completely, that is. It feels a bit like Dead Trigger, which isn't too unexpected, given its pedigree. The primary action is gleaned first person, such that one feels like one is carrying the gun used to inflict mayhem. The controls are pretty easy to navigate bottom left invokes movement, while the other side allows the player to pan around in place, as one would do while looking around. Used together, it is possible to effect reasonably natural movement. To begin, the game leads the player to a waypoint, and also shows how to shoot simply getting the crosshairs on a target initiates the auto-firing sequence. After that, it's up to find things zombies, really to shoot at. The zombies come in waves, and the basic premise is to shoot one's way through them, and make one's way to the level ending location. Survive and move on, so to speak. The game's inherent challenge is evident early on. Navigating an urban area such as a virtualized New York City can be tough, what with tall buildings to peek around and tunnels to explore. Zombie hordes get more conniving, and there are even boss creatures to contend with. The developer adds in some other features, like a distance shooting challenge, and the quick transitions and vivid cutscenes help make the game feel less formulaic. The directions are clear, and the use of boosts such as invulnerability, healing, multi-kills, etc. works well. The game awards cash for success, and this can be used to upgrade stuff. Real cash can be used to expedite the pace of improvements, but isn't entirely necessary. There is a little bit of gore, and there is the occasional salty word, but outside that, it is a nice looking game with a tested theme. It's a new kind of war, you're a new kind of weapon. You are Sniper X. Some targets are more valuable than others. Shoot your primary objective first, then pick off the rest. 7. Sniper X with Jason Statham It's true, I don't go above and beyond to do sniper games. At the risk of sounding wimpy they make me a bit queasy. Still, when it comes to Sniper X with Jason Statham, I am willing to give one a go. This one doesn't tarry when it comes to getting right into it. One should enjoy the visual presentation, starting off with arid scenery. It is presented in first-person perspective, with great use of pan-ins to help the player with perspective. The sounds are appropriately gritty, and there are overlays that appear now and then to help with navigation. One learns on the go, and in a relatively quick manner, the sighting and shooting system is laid out. Two player is armed with a basic sniper weapon. Zooming is accomplished by using a slider to the right of the screen, and firing is controlled by its own standalone virtual button, and one can swing the rifle direction by swiping the screen. The sighting mechanism is relatively easy to understand, and works intuitively. The gameplay itself is broken into missions, and a typical series has an objective of some sort usually dispatching a bad guy or two, or three from distance. It starts with a heroic sequence, and from there, starts to get a bit harder as one goes along. It makes sense to survey the scene too, as different targets have different priority levels. One almost wants to take out the high-level targets first, because the game AI lends itself to logic, in that taking an errant shot can have bad circumstances, usually attracting a hail of return gunfire. Each level has a set time to complete, so one cannot goof off too much. For moving targets, the focus button can help provide immediate stability. Successfully completed missions earn cash and XP, which can be used to up unlock upgrade purchase better gear. Real cash can be used to expedite this particular process. Folks that want to earn more cash can take part in training. If anything, the game does a good job of combining elements. The missions are fairly diverse, and don't only involve shooting bad guys. There is a defined progression of complexity, and it mostly works, with vastly changing landscapes and such. On the other hand, it is a bit bloody, so be warned. It keeps to the script, but not too rigidly, and has Statham. Not bad. Eliminate the opposing team. 6. Modern Combat 4 Zero Hour Modern Combat 4 is a first-person shooter that makes heavy use of cinematic elements to tell what we can only hope is a good story. The game is split up into missions with a few auto-saving checkpoints along the way. MC4 gives you waypoint markers to follow, which I'm happy to see. The actual shooting part of this title is great. There's plenty of action and the weapon selection is good. You have to learn to take cover, flank, and watch where your squad mates are. Some missions you play as the good guys and some have you take on the role of the villain, one Edward Page. This piqued my interest, but I'm feeling a little less enthusiastic having met Page. 
The problem I have with Paige is just the most prominent example of a wide-ranging issue with modern combat for it talks too much. Heavy dialogue in a game can be good, as long as it's well written. I could do without a lot of the voice acting in Modern Combat 4, though. Your squad mates seem to shout the same four phrases over and over. Let's get back to Paige for a second. I understand that he's the bad guy, game locked. I do not I repeat not need a 10 minute monologue from Paige over the course of a mission regarding how much he loves killing Americans. Listening to this character pontificate, threaten, and curse got old really fast. He sounds like a more pompous version of Duke Nukem if you can imagine such a thing. The concept of the rogue Green Beret turned terrorist is not a bad one, though a little predictable. It's the execution that needs work. There is also a multiplayer mode where you can face off against other players. Winning matches can add to your stockpile of in-game currency. Oh, did I mention there are in-app purchases? Yes, you can buy upgrades to make your character better in combat. These upgrades are not featured prominently, and I don't think you need to use them, but this is a $7 title, Game Loft. Why the upsell? Game Loft sorted out how to make a first-person shooter work on a touchscreen a long time ago, and MC4 is still solid in that respect. Drag on the left side of the screen to get a virtual thumbstick that controls forward-backward walking, as well as side-to-side -side strafing. Use the right side of the screen to aim and look. This area is also where you'll find your buttons to fire, lob grenades, and use the scope. I like that you can hit the attack button and continue to drag your thumb around to sweep your field of fire. This makes it possible to take out multiple enemies rather than painstakingly target and shoot each one. The game defaults to use aggressive auto-aim, which is a little unsportsmanlike, but it's very hard to aim without it. All these buttons work fairly well, with the exception of the grenade trigger. Here's the tower. I'm gonna need a couple minutes to get it back online. Do your thing, Dryden. I got your back. 5. Nova 3 Near Orbit Vanguard Alliance. Near Orbit Vanguard Alliance Aka Nova comprises of an elite squad of intergalactic commandos equipped with all kinds of high-tech gear to save the Earth and its survivors of the inevitable apocalypse against the evil Voltorites and any other scum of the universe. Sounds familiar? Well, it's clicky as games go but that doesn't stop the latest in the series Nova 3 from being any less entertaining. Gameloft is one of those mobile gaming companies that has tossed out a wider range of action-packed games that are all-encompassing in terms of entertainment and interesting gameplay. Nova 3 a first-person shooter again, is just as good as any that have come before and more so thanks to the upgraded graphics to suit today's high-performance mobile and tablet devices. Please keep in mind that Nova 3 is a large and heavy game that requires you to have at least 2 gigabytes of space available to download and install. Picking up where you left off from Part 2, Cal Warden, Warrior Elite, Crash lands on a long since abandoned planet Earth and is right away thrust into the thick of a raging battle between Nova Commandos and the Volterites. Things take an unexpected turn when you're beckoned by the godlike being named Prometheus who, on behalf of the Judgers, is ready to make you pay dearly for your company stealing an artifact of great power and value that could help make the Earth livable again. Of course, the road to evil is paid with good intentions and it's guys like Cal Warden who are expected to make things right. So naturally, since you need to atone for the sins of others, and being the only mature, level-headed person on the planet at the time, you're recruited for another Save the Fate of the Planet from Imminent Destruction mission. It's not like you can just say no either. Your task is to recover more artifacts for these mysterious judges. In a puff of smoke, off you go traipsing mysteriously abandoned spaceships and planets that are used as penal colonies to recover the artifacts. You'll meet old friends and form unexpected alliances in your endeavor to save the fate of mankind. The storyline is interesting enough and the dialogues are intense and quite amusing sometimes. The voice acting sounded a bit over the top, especially the narration between levels. Then again, the voice acting itself is quite heavy with deep voices and slow modulation. It all makes for a very in-depth styling but could have been toned down just a tad. Four. Hitman Sniper. Remember those sniper missions in some of the action games? Now imagine doing that for the entire game that's essentially Hitman Sniper in a nutshell. The game features Agent 47 perched atop a vantage point raining hell down on bad guys with his high-powered sniper rifle. Like Hitman Go before, Hitman Sniper is made from the grounds up for the mobile platform and it shows. The game is now available on EOS and Android for $4.99. Let's take a look. In Hitman Sniper, you are Agent 47 looking over a villa in Montenegro. You are given mission directives, requiring you to assassinate someone in the villa. The initial missions need you to take down one or two guys but later mission involve killing off people in creative ways, such as hitting them near the jacuzzi, killing them by shooting the burning lamp next to them, blowing the fuse box next to them, etc. 
Sometimes you are required to kill multiple enemies, at times you have to reach a particular score, which again involves killing as many people as possible in the given time. Each mission has one key objective, involving assassinating some high value target. Killing that person will start a quick countdown of a few seconds before you are extracted. Thus, you have to make sure you complete all your other objectives before taking out the main target while ensuring the main target does not leave. Your best bet is to hit the target right in the head for a quick, clean kill and get the maximum points. Hitting on the body usually does not kill the person immediately. If you miss the person is alerted. If you miss repeatedly or are too aggressive with your firing the security is alerted and the main target is likely to flee earlier. Here while that sniper's covering the street. 3. Half-Life 2. Half-Life 2 was released by Valve. Half-Life 2 is an icon of voodoo gaming as a whole, not just its genre of first-person shooting. The game is available for weekday I believe is anything running NVIDIA's SOC, and outright requires a controller to play. Never having played a Half-Life game before, I was quite excited at the opportunity. I've spent the part few weeks playing through this game. The protagonist for the Half-Life franchise, as well as its face, is that of Gordon Freeman, and I assumed his role for the entirety of the game. The story for this game is one that's heavily steeped in science fiction. This game picked up where its prequel left off, and opening with a sequence of Gordon being spoken to by a mysterious character, only to awaken on a subway heading for City 17, which is located somewhere in Eastern Europe. This place is completely overrun and occupied by the invading force known as the Combine, who are an aggressive empire from another dimension. Shortly after disembarking, I meet up with a member of the Human Resistance, and embark on my journey as Freeman from there. As the story progresses, you meet up with some of the characters from the original Half-Life, as well as get your arms around who this game's antagonist is. The gameplay of Half-Life 2 is solid, and a shooter through and through. It's not as simplistic as say the early Doom or Heretic games of your red key opens red door, to reveal blue key, etc. It's largely just killing things along a pretty fine path while occasionally being spoken to about where I am or what I'm supposed to do next. But despite the fact that, in some ways the game shows its age of 11 years, the flow between action and NPCs dialoguing with you Gordon never actually speaks in this game, it works and works well. And speaking of the action, this game has it in spades. Not only did I run around and generally cause mayhem by shooting things with close to dozen different weapons, but there were times I went those zombie infested parts of town, rode an armed jet ski, drove an armed dune buggy, used shoulder mounted rocket launchers that I guided with a laser sight, and more. If you like action, there's plenty of it in this game to keep you from betting bored. The settings locations were varied as well, ranging from the sea shower, to urban buildings, to the inside of a castle, to a nasty sewer with a jet ski, and more. There was also a great variety in the kinds of enemies I encountered, ranging from humanoids in SWAT armor, to quadrupedic spiders that mimicked facehuggers from Alien, to giant walking mechs, to flyers, to the zombified humans, giant insects, and so on. I seem to encounter different combinations of enemies in each of the different environments, so you'd face one kind for a while, then the entire makeup would flip enemies in setting, and you'd have to adjust a bit. Valve did a good job shaking things up every so often. And while the action is the focus of this game, that's not to say that there aren't puzzles. I found on a few occasions that I had to move objects around, found in the nearby environment, in order to progress through the game. For example, I might have to cross a chasm that is just too wide to jump, so I would need to find a plank to lay across it. At other points, it might be stacking boxes in order to climb up them. Nothing complicated, but it was nice to experience them, and see how they fit into the environment. Lastly, I'll touch on the firepower. Great. I've been stuck here for ages. All right, let's roll. Two. Dead trigger two. I know a shortcut. Beautiful zombies. Okay. Die again. I shout as I lay waste to a gaggle of undead, hell bent on eating my brains. I swing my wrench, landing a mighty blow against the crown of an incoming zombie. With the bulk of my ravenous foes lying in a bloody heap on the floor, I make the call to save the rest for later and rebuild a nearby barrier. Switching to my SMG in case more zombies approach from beyond the 2x4s nailed to the wall, I step to the opening and begin the job. It only takes a few moments, but every second counts. I dash past corpses in various states of decomposition, pump a few bullets into an explosive barrel to buy myself precious time, swallow a fistful of painkillers to up my health and reach my goal. I've already refilled the old generator with fuel, and now I must launch the satellite that will allow me to contact the resistance. It works, and my comms connect to the AM frequency. If you are hearing this, you are the resistance, the disembodied voice tells me. We have small pockets operating all over the globe. We must live on. 
We must fight. We need every single one of you. With this new drive to aid the human race, things are finally looking up. Dead trigger too but my HUD has just informed me a particularly nasty zombie, the Vomitron, is incoming. I turn as quickly as I can, and it is just in time for the terrible creature to lumber into view and spew puke into my eyes. I fire frantically in his general direction as I wait for the mess to clear, and when my vision returns I can see that he's brought some friends. Damn out of bullets. With a deep breath of resolve, I brandish my wrench once more and dash heroically into the fray. You like that? I ask as I land the final crippling blow in his melting, undead face. Developer Madfinger Games Dead Trigger 2 enters into the flooded market of zombie apocalypse titles with slick graphics, a massive arsenal, and dozens of little surprises that set it apart from the pack with ease. It isn't entirely clear where the infection began, but a zombie plague now infests America. You, along with a handful of conveniently specialized survivors, will travel across the south killing zombies, growing stronger, and chipping away at the terrible new world order. You'll begin alone with nothing save a wrench and a pistol, but the more survivors you come across and rescue, the more options you'll have for killing off zombies. Eventually you will become a killing machine and one of the last defenses against an army of terrifying monsters. Once you've torn through a few levels, Dead Trigger 2 opens up a bevy of interesting side missions that add lots of variety to the proceedings. In these side missions, you'll scavenge for supplies, provide sniper fire, or simply kill as many zombies as humanly possible in a set amount of time. The main campaign is certainly lengthy and is a blast on its own, but these bite-sized missions not only provide an informal means to sharpen your killing skills, but you'll be able to pick up blueprints from specialized zombies that provide new weapons and gadgets. These super zombies also appear in the campaign, but their frequency in side missions is notable. One. Lone Wolf first-person shooting games have been a craze since time immemorial in the world of gaming. Though it was brought to the mainstream by the world-renowned games like Counter-Strike and Call of Duty, the origins can be traced back to a game many loved playing in their childhood days. Yes, we are talking about the famous Duck Hunt here, which by the way, was also a technological wonder of its time. Video game gears like the PlayStation Kinect, which are prominent now just look to be a refurbished version of the technology available at the time of Duck Hunt. As the gaming gears have evolved over the years, so have the basic fundamentals of shooting games. Today's games focus on giving you a much stronger reason to shoot at those ducks. One such game that we have been playing since the last couple of days is Lone Wolf. The mobile-based game is available both on Google Play Store and Apple Store. Here is our experience with the game and the reason why it is different from all those regular sniper games available out there. Lone Wolf is a completely out-of-the-box first-person sniper game and the credit goes to its immersive storyline. FDG Entertainment, the developers of the game, have played smart and used basic comic graphics for an illustrious story. The way the story of the lead character has been portrayed and coupled with the actual gameplay is a unique experience in itself. In the game, you get to control Lone Wolf, a hitman who is out for revenge on a mafia boss who killed his family. A total of 35 missions in the game make you try out rifles, sniper rifles and pistols through various life ages of the lead character. Limited but enough number of weapons are available in the game. This is a huge relief from the endless number of characters or accessories in any other game that pushes you towards that gotta try em all feeling. A big plus is that the game does not require an internet connection to play, meaning complete accessibility to the game even in the absence of cellular networks. The layout of the game has been kept very simplistic. Simple options will guide you through the home page to the shooting range, mini games or the regular story mode. The gameplay is mostly seen through a sniper's scope, which you can move by dragging your finger anywhere on the screen. Zoom in zoom out options are on the side, along with the trigger to shoot. Little additions in the game make it more interesting, like the breathing of the sniper that makes the crosshair move periodically. This, the flowing wind, distance from the target and the situational analysis have to be taken into account to complete a mission. All in all, the game is challenging and requires a strategic approach to get through it. The game is free to download and has in-app purchases, all of which is accessible at a price of RS120.